Good morning to all of you. Um, I would like to welcome you along with um, Dr. Peter Kinch, who is um, co-chairing with me to this session. Um, so this is the first technology track this morning. Um, along with two of uh, my co-chairs with the technology track, um, Elizabeth Bailey and Jeff Curry, we have put together eight tracks over the next four days. Uh, we've endeavored to capture a range of topics relevant to molecular imaging. And in keeping with the Congress theme, uh, there is also a focus on radionuclide therapy and theranostics. Education, CPD, quality assurance um, also feature in the technology tracks over the next four days. <clears throat> the technology track one this morning focuses on hybrid imaging uh, recognizing the complementary roles of anatomical imaging and molecular imaging, as well as the role of radiation oncology, given that PET CT scans are increasingly integrated with radiation therapy planning and assist in um, determining tumor volumes for treatment. Um, having said that, uh, we haven't heard from Maureen Rolfall, who was going to uh, present the radiation therapy planning um, uh, talk, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, um, if she does not um, turn up, um, that's fine. We, we'll do, do without. Um, however, that just means both our speakers this morning don't have to rush it, <laughs> and there's plenty of time for questions. And could we please reserve questions for the end, because at the end we will have a, a panel discussion. So. We, we can uh, open it for discussion at that point. Um, firstly, though, uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, please switch off your mobiles or um, keep it on silent. Um, and the next thing I wanted to quickly spend a few minutes on uh, was the, the live polling app. Um, so there is a live polling app, at the, and there was a flyer at the registration desk uh, for interactive participation. Um, it's available for downloading onto your, your smartphones. Um, so could you please do that now, if you haven't done so already? Uh, but I might get, uh, I have two people here, uh, Soma and Colin, please put up your hands. Um, and they can help you with this. Um, they've just had a chat with uh, AV Techs, I think. So if you need some help, please ask them. We might spend a few minutes, actually, now that we have time in this session. Have maybe a show of hands. Who's got them on the, the phone already? OK. So there's a few who haven't. We could spend a few minutes whilst um, Peter goes through a few announcements as well to download it and ask for help if you need to. Soma, did you want to maybe do a quick spiel on what you've just learned? Or? So I've got a, just a very few announcements to get started, and they relate to the app that, um, that we use at this particular conference. And just to remind you that you can download the app and you search for in your um, app store the MCI group event portal. And once you get to that, you can enter in the, the name of the conference, which is WFNMB18. And everyone has an individual access code that you uh, should have been emailed to you or might be on your badge, I'm not too sure. And once you enter that, then you'll have your personalised um, access to the app. To make sure that your information in the app is up to date, you'll see a little um, cog on the right-hand side, and, and there in that particular settings allows you to refresh the content. But I've been noticing that every time I turn it on, it seems to refresh it's itself. Okay. So maybe you don't need to do that. You'll see that there's a, um, there's a QR scanner um, code that's displayed on the screen. And within the app, there's a QR scanner button that you can press. And if you point it at that particular code, you might have to, I don't know if it's going to work from that distance. Feel free to get up and move closer if you need to. Um, that will register that you actually attended this um, particular event. So you can get your um, CME points. Right. Did anyone need any help with the app or anything else before we start? <coughs> Over to you, Peter. Thank you. So our first speaker today is um, David Bims from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, and he's going to be talking to us today on PET-CT hybrid imaging in oncology.
benefits for the cancer patient. Thank you, David. Nobel, Nobel laureate um, <laughs> talking about the Big Bang Theory and the future of the universe. So bring your expectations right down. <laughs> so I'm going to talk um, on four areas. Uh, look at the history, what, we've, um, what we did pre-PET-CT, look at our ex current experience, what our current practice is, and also look a little bit into the future. So we installed our first scanner at Peter McCallum back in 1996, um, and very soon afterwards we realised there was a need to try and coalesce the information from functional imaging onto a, a structural template. And this is one of our first examples using Adobe Photoshop in a patient with um, a large right upper lobe mass uh, with peripheral collapse. Um, the pet's showing quite a nice um, delineation around a tumour, stuck them together using Adobe Photoshop with different amounts of transparencies, and this was then used for radiotherapy planning. We then got a little bit more complex. We used fiducial markers, and you can see the fiducial markers here on the, C on the PET and the CT, um, and this enables us to do more accurate um, carry registration and fusing of data together. In the early days, um, our nuclear medicine reporters became very adept at um, doing a, a neck top fusion of uh, the structural information on top of the, with, with the fused data. And dual trained um, specialists were one of the first times um, got to use both of, their, both of their skills. And very soon, um, whenever there was a CT available, it was the technologist's job usually to run around trying to find it, back in the good old days of using film bags. So with PET-CT, it was first seriously proposed back in the early 1990s. The first operational prototype uh, was uh, built in 1998, and the first commercial PET-CT scanner was introduced in 2001. In year 2000, um, there were lots of things happening around the world, um, and uh, the Time Magazine Invention of the Year in 2000 for medical science uh, was the PET-CT scanner. And this is quite remarkable. Before any proof of concept or before there was any evidence base that this particular modality or this combination of modalities was actually going to impact clinically. Once PET-CT did come along, there was very, very early adoption and rapid adoption of, the, of this modality. But there remained no evidence base that PET-CT was actually superior to PET. But anyone who used it, used it knew that it was better. Sensitivity of FDG in oncology drove PET in the 1990s. It was the specificity um, of FDG and CT in combination that drove PET-CT in the 2000s. So the addition of CT improved the specificity and therefore overall accuracy of FDG PET. By 2006, uh, PET scanner, PET only scanners were no longer available and by 2008, there were over 2,500 PET-CTs operating around the world. I realise that um, uh, most of you won't have seen um, uh, uh, the old-fashioned transmission attenuation source, the rod source in operation. The G scanners still use this rod source, which is rotating around here. This is actually a dummy source, it's not radioactive. Um, and it would rotate around the patient, uh, usually over a period of a couple of minutes, and then retracted back as it is now, back into the um, shielded um, receptacle. Very simple operation. This is pretty much the only moving part besides the um, uh, besides the, um, the scanning bed on the patient, on, on the scanner. All that changed with the introduction of the CT. This is with the covers off. I, I'm quite grateful that we don't scan our patients with the covers off. With the covers off. Um, this is, a, um, a, you can see here, the detector and cathode assembly uh, rotating around the patient. This one is rotating it around uh, one revolution per second. Um, this scanner is actually capable of two revolutions per second. I'm glad we're not trying to feed a patient through there at the moment with this going around. What could go wrong? So pre-PET-CT, pre transmission scans were done um, interleave between the emission scans. 
there was quite a, um, a, a long amount of time required to do the transmission scan. Um, PET-CT, when it was introduced, enabled us to do the transmission attenuation correction map from the CT data, which was acquired in seconds, whereas the uh, transmission scans were, were measured in minutes. And this made for a very strong business case, especially when Medicare revenue um, was introduced back in the early 2000s. The shorter transmission time, scanning time, increased throughput by up to 40%. And this offset was this offset against higher equipment and service costs. And this made a very attractive financial cost uh, case. So even though in the absence of there being any clinical data that was actually very, very useful, we were very passionate about the fact that it was, the, financial, the finance case um, had merit just on its own for the purchase of this type of scanner. So the impact of this technology, and the, um, even still in the absence of any clinical data that was actually there was efficacy for the modality, um, uh, there was a, a rapid escalation or shift towards PET-CT scanners from straight um, PET scanners. And so the lighter bars here, this starts back in the second quarter of 2002. The lighter bars there are the PET scanners, and even within a couple of years, sales were dropping um, drastically, while the proportion of PET-CT scanners was increasing. This is the North American sales market. Uh, early on, or about 2008, we decided to try and look at the Australian installed base. And here you can see there's a relatively static number of PET scanners over a period of about 14 or 15 years. Um, but once PET CT scanners, which is the graph here in pink, were introduced, there was quite a rapid uh, rise in the number of scanners. And this continued on till today, where there's probably close to 80 PET CT scanners in Australia. 81 next week. <laughs> <laughs> so what's that, what was our experience with PET-CT? This fine looking scanner um, uh, was installed, uh, the Discovery um, DLS, four slice CT scanner, uh, was installed in January 2002 at Peter McCallum. Um, it was the uh, fourth scanner in the world that was um, installed, and um, of this type of scanner was installed and uh, it commenced operations um, and uh, was, was very quickly embraced by our clinicians. I put this in just so my technologists know that I actually did see patients, I didn't know how to scan a patient. <laughs> and also what 20 years of being a chief technologist can really do to you physically. <laughs> so we very, very quickly saw the, the, the real value of PET-CT by being able to coalesce this functional and structural data you can see on a, a CT scan in the top left corner uh, a very complex picture of a, of a patient with um, a, uh, a central um, primary tumour with peripheral collapse. And very difficult to see what is tumour with um, quite uh, extensive invasion or is it just a localised tumour. For obvious reasons this really affects the management of this patient, clinical management. The PET scan uh, shows very strongly whereabouts there is disease and where there isn't but doesn't really give you any anatomical structures to really map uh, what is actually being affected or not. So this is a non-small cell lung cancer for staging. This patient also had a uh, equivocal 12 millimetre mediastinal lymph node, um, which is negative on PET. So quite a game changer for this particular patient. Um, next patient is a, one, is a patient with a um, superior sulcus mass and a uh, very um, heterogeneous tumour. This patient uh, went for uh, CT guided biopsy, which were negative, and obviously with sampling um, the wrong part of the tumour. PET was able to actually direct sampling to an area which was metabolically active and gave it a definitive um, pathological confirmation of what the disease was. Uh, in this particular case, this is a, a patient, a male, who presented with adenocarcinoma of unknown primary. Um, we are actually able to see a breast lesion and diagnose primary breast cancer. Um, and we also noticed a lesion um, in the anterior chest wall, which is very difficult to differentiate between being an um, internal mammary node or uh, head of clavicle. And um, we knew that there was disease there, but couldn't actually isolate it. And uh, you can see on the fused image down on the bottom there, um, a very accurate co registration to the, to the clavicle. It was about this time in the early 2000s that uh, targeted therapies in oncology were really coming to the fore 
And this is a GIST patient um, with a very, very large intrahepatic lesion um, and was being treated with Gleevec. Uh, and you can see that um, there is very, very rapid response um, uh, within a matter of months, very little metabolically active tissue, no metabolically active tissue after a period of uh, four or five weeks, and uh, whereas the CT remained virtually unchanged. And this was sustained for several years in this patient. So a very early interpretation or very early evidence that this disease was under control with this drug and that, um, that there was no need to change the course of action. And we've had a very strong relationship with our radiation oncology colleagues at Peter McCallum. Um, we actually installed a PET-CT scanner into their radiotherapy planning, their CT-SIM area in 2011. Um, and we have had uh, a number of cases, or we have had a long experience with um, uh, performing uh, CT-SIM on our PET scanner. So this is esophageal cancer case in this patient. Um, we were able to do the diagnostic scan and the, C and the radiotherapy planning in the one session. Um, we have got, uh, this patient has obviously got very um, avid uptake in their esophageal tumour, um, and we are able to do also eliminate distal metastasis um, to make sure that the patient was actually a radical therapy candidate. By being able to uh, um, combine the CT and the, and the PET in the same session, we are able to combine the two to accurately delineate, produce a, a, a GTV around the tumour, which is very, very accurate and usually can have a much smaller size than just by using CT alone. And from this data, uh, the radiotherapy team can plan the treatment of this, of this particular tumour. And there's been many papers um, out of uh, Peter McCallum on the advantages to the patient by having a smaller uh, GTV around the patient by increasing the dose to the tumour, but also importantly, reducing the dose to surrounding tissue. So it's not all beer and skittles. There are a number of um, disadvantages with having this form of co-registration, this, this form of scanner. Instrumentationally, there's near perfect registration. Our service engineers can guarantee a down to sub-millimetre error in the, in the, uh, the, um, the um, um, resolution and all the, all the maps on both the scanners. The CT, however, is a snapshot. Um, it's usually acquired within a matter of milliseconds, whereas the PET is acquired over several minutes. And this has issue. This has um, uh, an issue. This is an issue when um, looking at respiratory and myocardial movement. There's also a delay between CT and PET imaging, uh, from anywhere up between five minutes to thirty minutes. And this has effects on bladder filling differences between the two phases, uh, stomach filling. Um, arm and head movement, particularly problematic in patients for lying for a long period of time, um, and also small bowel peristalsis. And not directly related to misregistration, but attenuation correction is estimated from the CT data, and there are some errors in the estimate of attenuation correction from the Houndsville units on CT. This is a, a case of a, of a patient. The middle column there is... Um, I'll just have to see if I can get this... How do I get the laser working? Is that, is that a CNA? Pardon? Do you have a CNA, is it? Or well, it was lasers. working before, yeah, I just don't know how to work it now. Can we get the lasers working on the, the remote? The red button. The little red button. There we go, sorry. So the middle column here um, is our standard acquisition, and you can see uh, in the area of the liver here um, a very faint area which is the lesion. Very difficult to tell whether it's, whether it's in the lung or the liver, below or above the diaphragm. Um, one of the beauties of the non-attenuation corrected image is that it doesn't lie, it doesn't get affected by attenuation correction mismatches. So there's obviously a lesion there, but we can't really tell there whether it's a liver or a lung lesion. With this patient then went on to have um, a 4D study of PET and CT, so a motion match the, um, uh, on PET and on CT. And you can see it's now accurately um, localised within the liver itself. The problem with the attenuation correction on the, um, on the static picture, the 3D picture, is that it, the wrong attenuation correction is applied to liver often, and particularly in patients who have had lots of CTs. When they're doing their CT scan, the first thing they do is, is in, in, do maximum inspiration, 
which doesn't actually reflect the equilibrium um, or the mid-cycle mid type breathing that will be experienced most of the time on PET. So eventually there became uh, a body of evidence around the uh, effectiveness in PET. Um, this is a, a group from Israel which did a study on the diagnostic value and impact on patient management of FDG in suspected lung cancer recurrence. So this is a particularly problematic cohort of patients. They are uh, uh, following radiotherapy, chemo radiotherapy, and often their anatomy is disrupted. There's lots of other pathophysiology taking place, particularly um, uh, radiation pneumonitis, which can really cloud the picture for FDG, um, which is, as we talk, spoke about before, is, is quite nonspecific in its uptake. So the addition of CT into this, um, into the PET scan, um, drastically improved the specificity from 53 to 82%. And probably more importantly, the positive predictive value increased from 75 to 89%. So this means that a lot of patients who were being diagnosed previously from PET with having disease there, who went on to have further futile treatment, that could be negated. So what's the current practice? This is a slide pulled from many years ago. You can tell that by the ribbon down the side. That's what we did back in the good old days. Um, this is a, um, a slide that was done by, by Rod, um, the director of our department back in 2003, um, looking at the implications for on imaging practice. So aesthetic and practical advantages will make PET-CT the preferred imaging technique for cancer patients. Cost and credentialing issues, turf battles need to be resolved. High impact on conventional nuclear medicine. Uh, nuclear medicine training must adapt to changing technology with increased focus on anatomy and biochemistry. Radiology training must focus on physiology and biochemistry. And I think you agree that there's still very apt um, uh, implications that need to be addressed within nuclear medicine. We haven't fixed uh, many of these particular issues. I recently did a poll of um, uh, current Victorian practices doing PET, PET-CT, um, about what they're doing currently. Um, eight of the 16 sites, the 16 sites in Victoria now, it's about to be 17, um, there are eight sites offering diagnostic CT options to referrers. 11 of the 16 sites provided some radiotherapy planning option, whether being fully prescriptive or um, positioning the patient in, in a generic fashion. Three of 16 sites routinely performed more complex extended CT practice, and this relates to respiratory-gated CT, cardiac-gated CT, prescribed dose increases or decreases, um, modified CT reconstructions, and adaptive hybrid protocols. So I was a little bit um, not disappointed, but just uh, I just thought there was a room for improvement there. Only three of the 16 sites are actually in that domain. And it's not really, I think, when 10 or 15 years ago, we really thought we'd be in, that, in this space. I think you know, we all thought that there are lots of potential there for hybrid imaging. And I think a fair amount of that still remains unfulfilled. This is a, a plot of uh, those 16 sites on a graph. <laughs> Along the x-axis is the percentage of the PET scans uh, they estimate where they provide a diagnostic CT. And on the y-axis, is the, uh, the number of um, technologists that they roster through their PET centre who have obtained specialist um, CT qualifications, most likely the VSNT course here in Victoria. And there's a couple of things to note here. I think, quite gratefully, uh, a number of the sites that are doing diagnostic CTs have, in, have invested their, their technologists in doing that additional training, that additional qualification. A number of sites also have invested in that qualification but aren't actually doing diagnostic CTs. So what, what's the future? How can we actually improve the service we're providing to the patient? Now, I think everyone's got a different definition of what hybrid imaging is all about. Um, the simplest form is this contemporaneously acquired CT. So the chi acquired CT for attenuation and correction and anatomical localization, and certainly this is what's had the biggest impact on, our, on the effectiveness of this particular modality. 
Some might also see an extension of practice is in that we're doing diagnostic CTs, uh, being offered this to the referrer. Um, and this pretty much is just replicating the radiology test. Uh, it produces a separate report. It's convenient for the patient. And you probably get some advantage in the reporting of the, of the scan in the fact that the CT scan's been done in the same period as the, uh, as the PET scan. But there are other options that uh, are available for um, developing hybrid protocols. We can use different reconstruction filters. Very rarely our nuclear medicine doctors at Peter McCallum will actually ask us to do a different filter over the lungs or over bones to try and get uh, it make improved results. We do occasionally do 4D CT. This is no longer a very difficult um, thing to do on, on, on scans. Um, both um, Siemens and GE have got very, very uh, easy um, uh, technologies to achieve um, this sort of gating. At one stage, we were doing negative oral contrast. We give water in a number of our gastric uh, cancer patients, but um, not more beyond that. Uh, occasionally, our doctors will look at a previous scan and say, can we just bump up the MAS to get a much better picture of um, I don't know, uh, lymph nodes in the, in the upper ab ab abdomen? Um, we occasionally might say that the diagnostic CT that the referring doctors ordered uh, next to the PET scan isn't required because of the PET results. And we also um, can change the diagnostic CT to make it into a more hybrid type protocol for the advantage of the patient. So if you wanted to change your hybrid imaging, you need to have a certain amount of governance around how you're going to do it. And I think it's very, very important to actually always look back at what the primary aims of making these changes are. And it's patient safety and patient benefit, some fairly fundamental uh, reasons. How you go about achieving that is the hard part. Um, you need to make sure you've got appropriately credentialed staff, qualified staff, both me medical and technical. And I would propose that you need to have multidisciplinary invo um, involvement in the uh, governance of this particular modality. And that should include nuclear medicine, radiology, but also as the state mother stakeholder, which is the um, referrer. And these should have uh, determination on protocols that are used. I think it's very important that the protocols used in the uh, PET centre are equivalent to those that are used in the radiology department. They also, you also need to have a, a standard of care uh, framework around what your different tumour groups within the hospital, why they're referring patients for PET and CT scans. You need to ensure that standards and quality assurance are uniform across the whole of your imaging department. Uh, we qualify our CT scanners on our PET CT scanners with the state government um, and there are other quality assurance audits that uh, the College of Radiology performs which I think we should be involved in as well. We need to make sure that staff are trained, what's been um, technologists have been trained for in radiology, they need to also be trained for in, in nuclear medicine PET. And this group can also have a say around equipment selection. And the overall results of this are optimised protocols and improved clinical outcomes. I'd just like to draw your attention to a, a recent paper from Cancer Imaging. Um, and to, this, this, to me, this um, epitomises what hybrid imaging should be about. Uh, the authors on this paper are from um, the radiology group at our hospital, from the nuclear medicine group, and also from our referring doctors. And it introduces the idea of a modified hybrid protocol. So it's not a diagnostic protocol, it's not a PET protocol, it's a protocol which has been introduced across both modalities. Um, it's uh, a derivation of a diagnostic CT protocol um, and it's looking to try and identify where urine is within the urinary tract at any particular time to assist in the, in the um, evaluation of PSMA uptake, PSMA uptake in the prostate. So. This was achieved through a group, a number of people, um, coming together to, to try and make it work. So I think we all have different ideas about what hybrid imaging is, uh, multiple modalities, and certainly it's a coming together of uh, uh, two different uh, entities. And these guys are quite different. They um, both do different things. They've both been around for a long time, but they come together and produce magic. 
Some see um, hybrid imaging as a coalition. It's a couple of people that are quite different, very different, come from very different backgrounds, similar in age, um, but they're forced together on, on their own. They're not actually of any value um, to their party, but together they form a government. But there's some underlying tension. <laughs> um, other, and this is probably what the, the way I'd like to think about hybrid imaging is, is a partnership. So these guys are, are very different, um, they, but they both ride a horse. Um, one got a bit more bling than the other. Um, and they're both fighting a war against the baddie. And uh, I think this unites these two people together. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do. Our foe is obviously cancer. And just in closing, I'd like to thank the team from our molecular imaging department at, um, at Peter McCullum. And thank you very much. Thank you, David, for your presentation. I'd like to open questions from the floor, please. And just, um, there's a microphone there if you um, would like to use that, or if you feel like you've got a loud voice, just shout it from where you're sitting. Okay, so while you're thinking about questions, I've got one for, for you, David. So when you, you talked about the financial model of introducing PET-CT initially. Was the staffing, like technologist staff levels, considered in that financial model? I imagine you would have needed to have more staff to, to perform additional scans. I think the increased throughput, the um, increased number of scans we did in the day, um, certainly uh, impacted on our, on our pet seat, on, our, on the service and, and the staffing with technologists. Um, we replaced one camera with our first PET-CT camera. And I think as lots of technologists know, but not a lot of um, nuclear medicine physicians or a lot of hospital administrators know, that the, the technologist is involved in, in everything uh, on, around the patient, getting the patient off the scanner, and it doesn't really matter um, how fast that scan takes place. There's still the same unit, unit of work, whether the scan takes one minute or, or mm. 10 minutes. So yes, you are doing more patients in a day, and we've got a bit of a benchmark that we're in agreement with our administration that um, we allow uh, you know, one staff member for five patients a day, which just is a bit rough benchmark. Um, and certainly that increased markedly when we started doing PET-CT. You can't help but doing more patients. And, you know, the modern cameras now are probably performing at twice the rate of that particular scanner, which was a, a, a 2D BGO scanner um, in 2002. And our throughput probably has pretty much doubled since then. But it's all about getting patients into the, onto the scanner, you know, injecting yeah. onto the scanner. It's not as much the scanning time. Great. Thanks, David. Did anyone else have any questions? Did you want to use the mic? Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, David, you were talking about raising the radiation therapy confinement, which you said um, the way the radiation therapy positions patients compared to what you can get through the quality scan as far as the PET-CT and next year. Obviously, they're doing whole body PET scans and finding a lot of the simulation is the position. How do you overcome? Um, there's certainly a lot of compromise done. I think um, at one stage with our head and neck patients, I mean, obviously the value of the PET scan comes from doing the whole body work. That's where you get the major impact on what sort of treatment and what sort of staging the patient's going to have. Uh, so we were very much focused on doing that well, as well as over, over the primary site. But obviously our head and neck um, uh, radiotherapy staff were trying to make sure that they got a very clear picture over the head and neck. So instead of doing one pass, we ended up doing two. We do that, still do that a lot of the time. Um, and it, it, it does come to the fore very often, but I think the important thing is to, is to have uh, a way, in, and it comes around to the governance of that, in that you both agree to do a little bit of compromise or come to a, 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 a decision that's going to benefit the patient. It always comes back to that. So we quite often in, in radiotherapy planning, or well, sorry, the staff um, quite often will um, change the position of the patient to accommodate um, the requirements of radiotherapy planning. Some of their positioning apparatus is very, very onerous on the patient, and we find that by the time they finish a long PET scan, um, that they are very, very at the end of their tether. And that's probably one of the, the other things that we find, is just, you know, when you've got your head right back in, in a mask um, and you can barely breathe, to do that for 10 minutes or so while you're doing a planning study is not so bad, but when you're doing it for half an hour, it, it becomes problematic. Any other questions? 
Hi, Colleen. Um, we've been asked to do 4D diagnostic liver CTs. When you say you're doing them in your hybrid PET, are you doing a PET scan and then going back and doing 4D diagnostic CT, or are you doing it as part of the whole scan? Um, both. So there are there were a number of trials we did with radiotherapy planning where we would do it prospectively, um, and a lot of our planning, uh, a lot of our um, radiotherapy planning is now done uh, with respiratory gating, um, and we needed to incorporate. Pet on top of that. So in that area, we do it fairly routinely, but there are a large number or a significant proportion of our patients where uh, our nuclear medicine physicians were requested. I don't think we've done too many prospective scans with 4D. It tends to be an additional scan subsequent to the scan to clarify the findings. Yeah, I imagine you would have to just because, as you said, it's such a long time for the patient. I just don't see how it would work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a... I mean, the modern scanners are very, very efficient and sensitive. So I know when we did early work with 4D PET, we found that we just didn't get enough counts in each of the buckets. Um, whereas now, that's not so much of a problem, especially with, um, you know, um, I think the, the increased sensitivity of the scanners. Um, and you can also uh, acquire the scan. If you're doing it prospectively, a lot of the new scanners will allow you to actually acquire it and reconstruct it later and rebin it. So you've got that initial diagnostic scan, but you can then break up the information later after you've acquired it in this mode. But yes, it, is, it can add a lot, but that's like any extra view in, in nuclear medicine and PET. It's always a bit of, you know, raise the eyebrows and say, do we really need it? But yes, um, it, it's, it, it's, I don't think it's, as, it's actually as quite as bad as it was several years ago. It's actually quite a lot easier. Well, I've got a list of questions for David, but I'm going to refrain <laughs> to only two. Um, um, so, David, because you do so much of um, radiation therapy planning and integrate um, very successfully the PET-CT scans, in fact, you operate, um, I think, within the radiation oncology suite? or In, in our old hospital we did, but we've, they've moved over to one that's located within the PET centre now. Right. So I, I was just wondering whether you could give us a feel for sort of the, the percentage of scans that you do um, uh, that actually contribute towards radiation therapy planning management and also maybe a feel for, I know it's a very broad question, um, up, that contributes then to upward management or downward management once the metabolic volumes have been integrated. Um, so our... Our radiation um, therapists um, come up to our centre. Um, and we have various types of radiotherapy planning. We have got a sort of fully prescriptive one where they come and position the patient and use full um, you know, uh, localisation and, and restraints on the patient. Um, we do other ones where we just, uh, for example, um, where we have a patient that don't know whether they're going to be a radiation therapy, radiation therapy candidate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and they will quite often have a, a, a positioning in a, in a generic type position. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, in theory, can subsequently be co-registered to a CT sim. Um, a lot of our prescriptive um, radiotherapy planning patients will actually have the CT will be used um, to calculate dose. So it's a full, I think, that's the electron density map that they use on the on the on the um, uh, Linux. We probably do um, about I don't know, I guess between five and ten of those types of fully prescriptive radiotherapy planning scans a week. Um, uh, and in that particular case, the radiotherapists come up, they position the patient uh, after we've injected them and just before we scan them. So that's required quite a lot of um, education of the mm. therapists around radiation safety as well. Luckily, we were doing that at our old hospital, and they were intimately involved in that, so it's not a, a whole new um, uh, ball game for them. Um, the advantages, and there's been a number of studies that um, performed... Um, around the world, looking at the impact of the PET data on the um, GTV mm -hmm. um, the treatment volume. So uh, it is certainly, um, it has a major impact on it, an improvement. Um, and I think most radiation oncologists would like to use the PET data to try and conform the, the region as small as possible. And, and you know, it, it, I, I can't um, state what the, you know, the values are in the improvement off the top of my head, but um, our radiation oncologists are very keen in the, in the lung and the head and neck domain to, to use radiotherapy planning using PET. 
Thank you. Any other questions for David? Well, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, David.